So let's get right into it. What we have for those who are doing the beekeeping, we have, uh, if we're lucky, in our hives, we use, uh, if we just have a look back here, the Barry has uh, two super overwintering hives. He use, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get the right button. So there are two, two brood boxes here, and we hope in those two, two brood boxes that we've got about 18,000 bees that have successfully overwintered. And uh, we have, by the end of the summer, have to get up this, or before the honey harvest, have to get up to 60,000 bees. And I have to say that one of the things about beekeeping is uh, I don't believe the beekeepers make a fortune out of pollination services that they provide. It helps, but all most of their income is honey-based, isn't it? And we haven't, that hasn't been said this morning, and I'm going to say it now because it's really, really important, because Apis mellifera, this lovely little lady here, is the only one who can collect the honey and bring it back to a hive that we can get extract. So she's very, very important. Inside the hive, there's mother, always to be obeyed. And she's got all her daughters who do all the work. We won't worry about this guy too much right now. He's fairly limited in his, his uh, opportunities and what he does. All right, uh, the, the queen, when she's up to speed, is laying 2,000 eggs a day. And if you're laying 2,000 eggs a day, you better have something to eat, right? I mean, it's a, it's a lot to ask. And so these little ladies, these daughters, sitting around her are the nurse bees. They, yes, they are attenuating her. They are tapping her and sensing the, all the chemicals that are involved there. We won't get into pheromones right now. Um, but more importantly, they are all feeding her. They, and, and so she can go and lay her eggs. So the nurse bees are absolutely critical, and that's the stage, and we'll go into that stage now. Um, the, um, the eggs hatch, the, the eggs that are laid by the, whoops, sorry. The eggs that are laid by the queen, uh, you can see them sitting neatly in the bottom of the cells here. Some of the wax has been cut away. And then on the right-hand side of this, you see the first instar larvae floating in a bed of royal jelly, which is 67% water. So water is an important nutrient inside this hive as well. All right, let's have a look at what goes on in the first week here. The queen goes in and she, she lays her egg. Day, we'll take this as day zero or day one. Three days it takes for it to go through its embryology and come out as a little larva, and then it is fed by the nurse bees. It is fed initially with royal jelly, and then after that, the nurse bees are busy with the hyperpharyngeal glands and salivary glands, digesting the protein from the pollen that has been brought into the nest and feeding the larvae, which in a short five or seven days managed to get through to full size. So now we're about eight or nine days into the process. And then when they're absolutely fully grown, they're essentially a bundle of protein with a few other things inside as well, and they get capped at this stage. And in the, during the capping process, they also defecate all the, all the residue that's in their, in their gut so that they become just about a pure protein bag. And that, with the marginal discs, reorganizes into the structure of the bee. And then, first of all, it's white, and then it colors up, and the eyes color. And finally, it's mature, and it can crawl out. And this is three weeks after the laying of the egg. That's the first three weeks of the bee's life. In the next part of it, the worker's bee life in the summer, when she's working flat out, occurs in six short weeks. Three weeks as an nurse bee, three weeks as a forager. First job, it's always the housework. It's got to get done, clean everything up, get it ready for the queen. And she comes in and lays her eggs, and they start to hatch, and then the nurse bees get to work feeding them and nourishing them. That is a tough time for the bee, for the nurse bee, because not only does she um, get the nutrient from the pollen, and that she's also probably putting in some of her own body tissue that she accumulated as a grub. She's probably putting some of that in as well. And that's why nutrition is very, very important at this early stage of the bee's life. Later on, she'll, she'll learn to uh, transfer nectar. Nectar is the energy food that keeps them all going, so she's got to have the energy food. And about the same time, she also, uh, and this is passed on to her, by um, tongue to tongue, uh, we'll show you a bigger, bigger and better picture of that in a minute. Um, 
but it's passed on from the foragers, bringing you back into the hive. And then the very important thing that the nurse bee can now start to do, after she gets the carbohydrate from the nectar, she is able to produce wax. And it's that wax that is used to make the comb that every, everything else is living in. So these wax plates start to occur underneath the abdomen and uh, they can be taken off then used to make the comb. So she'll continue, because she gets a good nectar supply, she'll continue to make comb uh, for about <clears throat> three and a bit weeks. And at the end of three weeks becomes a forager where she goes out and collects both the pollen to bring it back into the hive for the rest of the hive and for the new group of foragers that come in, or the new nurse bees, and will also be doing the comb building. Now, it's been estimated by this fellow Seeley back in 1995 that a single colony over the course of a year requires 20 kilograms of pollen. Um, that's a lot of pollen if you're ever trying to get it together. But as importantly, 120 kilograms of nectar. This is the energy food for the, for the bee. And that's what gets made into honey. Now, depending on the nectar and just how much water is in the nectar, it all has to be reduced so it's no more than 18% water. If it's any more than 18% water in the honey, it'll ferment naturally on its own, and that really spoils the production by the beekeeper. So he, he wants it fully, fully dehydrated. But it also takes about five to eight grams of honey to make one gram of wax. I've yet to scrape off a comb, a dry comb, to find out how, how much wax you really need to make that comb. That's one of the projects that's coming out on my postdoc. Okay, 25 liters of water, absolutely necessary for evaporative cooling and it's vital for the nurses for their royal jelly. Right, so the, the, um, this forager came in with a very full crop here and is busy passing it along to the nurse bees. You'll notice there's one, two, three, four busy little ladies here all lapping up the regurgitating nectar coming from the crop, which has already started to be processed by enzymes that the bee is carrying in the crop. And so the, the crop is a very, very important. It's actually waterproof. So the nectar that comes in there doesn't create any osmotic problems for the hemolymph inside the, the bee. Uh, as, as the nurse bees go around, they're also cleaning up and absorbing things that goes into, a, that goes past through because they don't have a crop full of nectar that gets passed through into the rectum. And it is not, uh, it's not passed straight through. They have to go on a defecation, what's called a defecation flight. Many of you have come across this on a nice fine day when you put out the sheets, it's freshly washed. <laughs> have the bees go flying over them and put their little yellow spots on them. Um, yeah, which is a bee going through a stification flight. I get it all over my notes too when we, dis <laughs> when we disturb, disturb the bees. Inside the hive, um, the queen has started laying at the top here and she laid and laid and laid and laid and laid. All these are capped brood. Here's, here's the brood that's just about ready for capping. And then down here there will be the very, very young larvae. Uh, just a slightly bigger view of it, you can see these nurse bees. They will pick up the pollen that's been deposited here by the foragers coming in. They will process it, turn it into a, a soluble food, and whether it's just digested pollen or it's actually made into royal jelly with the hyperpharyngeal glands. So they will give it into the larvae at this stage. And when they're big enough, at this stage, they will get capped and away they'll go. Honey is also stored in the, in the comb, and that's what, whoops, that's what stored honey looks like. All right, and we'll get on, on to this model. I just want to run through a few numbers with you. This may be going through it too fast, probably to assimilate it too, too well, but essentially what I'm looking here at, this is what's overwintering in the hives. This is based on data taken directly out of Barry's hives. And we want, and you see, you've got a larva here, those three will go down to the next week. There's a time scale we're going across here by weeks. And you see here, okay, she was laying 3,000 <coughs> a week um, during the overwintering time, but then she got to crank up to 12,000 a week if she's going to get the numbers right for the summer. And if we follow this through now, I'll put all these up so we can just follow this number down. If you follow these 12,000 here, they become larvae, and then they pupate, and then they emerge here as a nurse bee, and then that nurse bee becomes, uh, she's now in the second week, in the third week, this, we actually split the hives here. Um, so that's why the numbers got halved. That's what the split means. And this is how uh, a beekeeper makes a second hive. But that group of bees, that cohort, continues down here. And it's not until the 2nd of November 
six weeks later, nine weeks later, that this last of these bees here. Now this is all new season production. But notice that this is new season eggs that have gone through full development by this time. And that's, that's a very important aspect of it. People who are looking after bees and beekeepers, they come down and they look at the number of bees, like this number down the bottom here. You look at the number of bees and say, oh, well, I've got that many bees, that's good. But you don't really realize that there's so many cohorts of bees that had to be produced to get there. And um, each cohort is represented by its own color there. But it's probably easier to see it and appreciate it with this diagram that here's the queen ramping up, laying eggs, so the eggs get up to this maximum number of 36,000. And then we had the split, but she comes straight back up to production. And she keeps this very, very steady production going on all through the summer to get the hives ready for pollination and then to go into honey collection. The number of nurse bees is also needed to nourish those larvae. And then, of course, they become forager bees in their own turn. And so it's, yeah, it's not until about November 2nd, well out here, that you've got that full complement of bees in the hive. That is the challenge of building up the hives in the spring. Now, Paul is probably going to correct my numbers for me sometime, but that's all right. You're welcome to do that. Um, but this, this is the big objective at the beginning of the season, so that when you get out and you go into the honey, that you've got a full complement of bees. They're going to collect that honey crop, which is a, a has got necessary components for feeding the bees, but more importantly, has got the beekeeper's income. Okay, so that's about as far as I want to go on that. So thank you very much. Yes. I saw some bees coming back into a feral pipe one time late in the evening and I collected them and I was looking at them that evening and I'm pretty sure that most of what they had in their crop and a lot of them had full crops was actually water that they had been bringing back into the hive for the evening because then they have evaporative needs and feeding for the nurses as well. Very important part. Yes? At the, at the risk of sounding like I don't know a lot and I don't, um, what, 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 is, what is it? That drives the bees to get so much honey that you can cream it off. I mean, is it is it is there some you know why, why do they collect a whole lot more than they need? Um, what are the drivers behind that? You know, in terms of that? Oh, one of the normal normal things that hives will do is that they will swarm and make a new colony. And when they do that, this honey that they've stored, if it's not taken away from them for other reasons, uh, will be used. They will all imbibe a great deal of that honey, and that becomes their initial energy store when they go to the new nest to try and build their new nest. And so we sort of cut that off and harvest that honey for ourselves rather than letting them do that. But one of the reasons we split early in the season is so that we don't have a hive full of honey when we really want it to be in a particular place in the hive, in the part of the hive structure. John, the reality is that bees be only, or social bees be only bee that actually overwinters. So a bumblebee will die out of the winter and lay another queen. So a bee needs to store honey to get through the winter. So that's the idea, is that trying to <coughs> store honey to get them through the winter. Yeah, but then if you've got, uh, if you've got four honey grains sitting on top of your brew box, why can you take two of those away or three of them away? Because they've made a surplus. But the reality is that a bumblebee doesn't make honey because um, they don't go to winter. Surplus over what they need. So a bee will naturally 